Hello again, welcome to my channel. My name is Marty Braden. I hope the curiosity that moved you to click on my video will be satisfied with the information I'm going to share with you. This video's title is The Cosmological Crane. I want to take just a moment, uh, before I go on and do the video, to briefly explain why I started my channel. It will help you understand and appreciate this video, along with all the other videos in the series I'm doing, when you find out why I'm doing them. After I retired a few years back, I spent the last two and a half years researching and writing the manuscript that I later titled An Atheist Delusion. It's now a published book that shares my perspective as a Latter-day Saint on Richard Dawkins' atheist book, The God Delusion. Recently, I decided to do the video series where I'm reviewing every single argument Richard Dawkins puts forth in his book to try and convince his readers to stop believing in the existence of God. This video is part 86 of this series, so let's pick it up from where I left off last time, which is the last subtitle in chapter 4. Its title is An Interlude at Cambridge, so let me go right to that. Richard begins this subtitle by telling his readers about a conference that he attended at Cambridge where the attendees discussed science and religion. Richard was one of the guest speakers along with several additional speakers with varied backgrounds. The conference was sponsored by the Templeton Foundation. The John Templeton Foundation is a philanthropic organization that reflects the ideas of its founder, John Templeton, who became wealthy via career as a con contrarian investor and wanted to support progress in religious and spiritual knowledge, especially at the intersection of religion and science. Upon learning that the foundation had paid several scientists and journals, journalists $15,000 each to attend the conference, Boy, that makes me want to figure out how I can participate in that kind of a program, don't you? Anyway, I'm just kidding. Richard's suspicion was aroused as to whether or not Templeton was using his money to suborn science journalists and subvert their scientific integrity. While at the conference, Richard challenged the theologians with his go-to question. Richard asked them to consider his point that a God capable of designing the universe, or anything else for that matter, would have to be complex and statistically improbable, which is Richard's main go-to -to argument against there being a God, next to the infinite regression question that it brings about. The response Richard got from the journalists attending the conference was that Mr. Templeton was foisting a scientific epistemology uh, upon an unwilling theology, and that scientific arguments, such as those Richard was accustomed to deploying in his own field, were inappropriate since theologians had always maintained that God lay outside of time and space and that he was a simple God, not a complex one. Maybe other scientists, I mean other theists or theologians, um, like myself, I'm a theist, maybe they believe his theory that he just described, but I certainly do not. It is most definitely not my view regarding Richard's description of God's so-called statistically improbable intelligence. I think I've been clear in giving my Latter-day Saint perspective of God's omniscience, and so I won't repeat myself here except to say that it appears that Richard is unable to comprehend how a divine being such as the eternal, divinely intelligent God that I believe in is capable of doing such incredible things. For example, answers to prayers, which is where God sends messages to us, his children, directly into our hearts and minds. This is just one example of his divine abilities that Richard just cannot get his head around. Richard also doesn't understand how his messages can be intercepted by us with our human brains. And second, be capable of sending these intelligible signals to millions of people simultaneously, as well as him receiving such messages from billions of us simultaneously. I did a video on that. Um, you can find that. I talked about this very thing. This says a lot about Richard's lack of spirituality, for sure, meaning his stunted understanding of spiritual things. But, of course, you would expect this of an atheist. They just don't spend their time thinking about this sort of stuff, at least not in any great depth. I've already given one analogy to answer Richard's criticism against the reality of God, an analogy about the spiritual principle called prayer. The analogy was that of a prayer answering search engine kind of uh, system, kind of uh, an incredible mind that can do those searches, much like the Google search engine tool of communication we all use every day of our lives. My question to Richard and other atheists was, how were human brains capable of coming up with Google's complex search engine with all of its power to receive and answer billions of queries coming in simultaneously. If puny human minds 
can uh, think of such a thing and are able to produce such a complex, powerful, limitless communication tool, then most certainly the gloriously intelligent mind of God with its unfathomable degree of intelligence could at the least match their puny brain power. Don't you think? Well, I certainly do. Certainly, one can imagine this kind of being that could surpass the human mind like AI will do one day. I was watching a video from um, Elon Musk being questioned and how he talked about AI and where that's going, how quickly these machines learn and how they will, and even in very much so very close to surpassing the brain power of humankind right now. And therefore, it would be cap this kind of uh, situation would be capable of having his own kind of prayer answering search engine capacity for receiving and sending billions of prayers. Certainly, a, a God that is knows all certainly could come up with a way to answer prayers simultaneously of five billion people. Like I gave several possible illustrations in that video. Okay, please note that I'm <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not saying that this is fact or is in fact how God does this. I'm just putting forth an idea that God certainly has a greater intellect than we humans have or even can imagine, and so his mind certainly surpasses ours in our, how imaginative he is and how he can communicate with his children. We ourselves don't even know the, capa don't even know the capacity of our own minds, what it can do. Uh, when it's fully released and not encumbered by this fleshy tabernacle and it's in a glorified body, what will we be able to think and do is beyond comprehension, in my opinion. This is just one example of how God's divine attributes, the main one being his mind, which has the power and capacity to handle the spiritual principle we call prayer. God has many more divine attributes that we as human beings find next to impossible to imagine or comprehend. Everything God does with his divine attributes shows his ways are not our ways. That is for sure. The following verses of scripture in the first book of Moses relates the account given by Moses where Jehovah appeared to Moses. After Jehovah is the Old Testament, he was Jesus Christ made in the flesh. After Moses was left to himself, he realized and declared that man compared to God is nothing, even as the dust of the earth. In other words, O puny man with his arm of the flesh being nothing, like dust is nothing when compared to God's mighty power and glory. Keep in mind that the person speaking in these verses is Jehovah, like I said, who is speaking as though he is the Father. He does so, as I have suggested in an earlier video, by virtue of the principle called divine investiture of authority. Read these verses carefully as they reveal a very complex understanding of who God the Father is and who his only begotten Son, Jehovah, is. Moses 1, verses 1 through 10. The words of God, which he spake unto Moses at a time when Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain, and he saw God face to face, and he talked with him, and the glory of God was upon Moses. Therefore Moses could endure his presence, because the Holy Ghost was there to protect Moses' mortal flesh. If he wasn't there, he'd have been burnt up. That's for darn sure. Verse 3, And God spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, thy, Lord God Almighty, and endless is my name. For I am without beginning of days or end of years, and is not this endless? And behold, thou art my son, wherefore look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands, but not all. For my works are without end, and also my words, for they never cease. Wherefore no man can behold all my works, except he behold all my glory. You can't see all that he's done and not see his entire glory. And no man can behold all my glory and afterwards remain in the flesh on the earth. That's interesting, pretty deep. And I have a work for thee, Moses, my son, that thou art in the similitude of mine only begotten. And mine only begotten is and shall be the Savior, for he is full of grace and truth. But there is no God besides me. Wonderful God, the God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, God the Son is full of grace and truth. He's saying that, but, but there is no God besides me or above me is what he's saying. And all things are present with me. Past, future, <laughs> current, always before him. How, how? For I know them all. Though Jehovah is God's Son, he is not above God the Father, neither is God the Holy Ghost above the Father. And now behold this one thing I show unto thee, Moses, my son, for thou art in the world, and now I show it unto thee. And it came to pass that Moses looked and beheld the world upon which he was created. And Moses beheld the world and the ends thereof, and all the children of men which are and which were created. Of the same he greatly marveled and wondered. 
and the presence of God withdrew from Moses, that his glory was not upon Moses, and Moses was left unto himself, and as he was left unto himself, he fell into the earth, and verse 10 says, and it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses did again regain his natural strength like unto a man, and he said unto himself, now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. <laughs> that experience shocked him, like I said in the last video, if we put Richard Dawkins and plopped him right in God's presence and he saw the same thing Moses saw, he would say, man, is nothing too. And it was something he never supposed that God had such glory and power and creative capacity and all that he has created without end. These verses reveal a great deal about God, uh, the God of the universe, and about his only begotten son, Jehovah, who we know to be Jesus of Nazareth, who became clothed in flesh so he could fulfill his role in calling excuse me, as the Savior of the world, even our advocate with the Father. After this Cambridge experience, Richard Dawkins reflected, quote, The theologians of my Cambridge encounter were defining themselves into an epistemological safe zone where rational argument could not reach them because they had declared by fiat that it could not. Who was I to say that a rational argument was the only admissible kind of argument? <laughs> there are these other ways of knowing that must be deployed to know God, end quote. I say, meaning spiritual experiences such as this account of Moses, which Richard knows little or nothing about. Richard continues, quote, the most important of these other ways of knowing turned out to be personal, subjective experiences of God. See, that's what I just said. Several dis discussants at Cambridge claim that God spoke to them inside their heads just as vividly and as personally as another human might. I have dealt with this illusion and hallucination in chapter 3. Yes, we certainly have. We went through every part of that, titled The Argument Against Personal Spiritual Experiences. But at Cambridge Conference, I added two points. First, that if God really did communicate with humans, the fact would emphatically not lie outside of science. Second, a God who is capable of sending intelligible signals to millions of people simultaneously and of receiving messages from all of them simultaneously cannot be whatever else it, he might be, simple. Such bandwidth, end quote. <laughs> Richard's great. Like I said, Richard, it may be very much like a powerful Google prayer search engine kind of mind, as well as it being a super transmitter, right? Special kind of way, special kind of light. We go back to those videos and listen to what I said here. It applies to what Richard's saying. Or maybe he uses his angels to answer our prayers, I said. Yes, that is some bandwidth for sure. As I said, I am not saying that this power to receive and answer prayers is a Google type search engine. What I am saying is that it's just one possible theorem for you and my viewers who are reading my book and or watching these videos. It's for you to consider and imagine in your mind out of the many unimaginable possibilities that we might posit. One day God himself will reveal to us the how he answers all our prayers, for he truly does in ways that give us hope and increased faith and joy. Richard goes on to expose his deep lack of understanding of God's nature, or dare I say his lack of having his consciousness being raised by the mysteries of godliness as they relate to the nature of the original prime mover, God the Father. Here's Richard making my point perfectly. Quote, to suggest that the original prime mover was complicated enough to indulge in intelligent design, to say nothing of mind-reading millions of humans uh, simultaneously, is tantamount to dealing yourself a perfect hand at bridge. Look around at the world of life, he says, at the Amazon rainforest with its rich interlacement of Leonus, lian, Brahmamiliads, roots, and flying buttresses. Richard continues, its army ants and its jaguars, its tapirs and picaries, tree frogs and parrots. What you are looking at is the statistical equivalent of, listen to what he says, a perfect hand of cards. And it, this is me, and it was good, Father in Heaven said, complete, finished, perfect. 
You're right, Richard. And he continues, except that we know how it came about by the gradualistic crane of natural selection, biological crane. That's what he's talking about there, end quote. It's amazing to me that Richard can use words like we know when in fact he does not know. Saying it is so does not make it so. I don't think Richard is purposely lying here. At least I hope not. And so that is why I say he suffers from an atheist delusion. I don't think Richard realizes it, but he just said God's creations were perfect. A perfect hand of cards, which was the case when God said it is good or perfect and complete and finished as they existed in the Garden of Eden, each being immortal as um, as all his creations were immortal before the fall of man happened. Which fall changed everything? No need for evolution then, right? He just used a list of jungle creatures to describe perfect creations, did he not? He described them perfectly. Before the fall of man, God's creations were in fact perfect and immortal. But after the fall, everything fell to its fallen state, imperfect beings and imperfect creations. And things such as thorns and weeds were introduced into this fallen world, as was death, sin, and earthly evil, such as tragedies like tsunamis, floods, and earthquakes, all of which come by way of the so-called Mother Nature. Understand, this fall and falling down to a fallen creature changed everything like I said. It, it caused a situation where we now were susceptible to death, whereas in the garden, Adam and Eve would have lived there forever if they not had transgressed. Everything there was spontaneous. It's spontaneously bearing of fruit. It didn't die and grow new seed. It just spontaneously continued and would have continued forever. But the fall changed everything. The entire capacity of the earth to produce spontaneously, it went to death and new seeds and growing and death and seeds and new growing. This is just a few of the many kinds of what people call the evils of this world. The fact is the evidence of the perfection that all things once had at their beginning in the garden is all around us. And it's nice to read that Richard admits it in his perfect hand of cards analogy, especially since he and all his scientific uh, friends, for that matter, cannot offer one example. They can't offer one example of a developing animal that's in the process of iterations being taken up the Mount Improbable by the process crane Richard calls natural selection. Not even one. No new kind jumping to a new kind, and then the process of that multi-million year process of jumping to a new kind, there should be iterations. It should be iterations that shows the defect or the mutation or the challenge that is waiting for new parents to create seeds that will go and take the best and keep on going to full process to a perfect animal. And yet Dawkins calls them perfect in a perfect hand of cards. Anyhow, although Richard admits that there must have been a first cause of everything Richard says, but it must have been simple. For that is where natural selection can only have its start, he says. For that is where it can only have its start. It does not start with complexity. And therefore, whatever else we call it, Richard says, God is not an appropriate name unless we very explicitly divest it of all the baggage that the word God carries in the minds of most religious believers. That's what Dawkins says it has to happen. And those being resurrection, and etc. To suggest that the first cause, the great unknown, which is responsible for something existing rather than nothing, is a is is a being capable of designing the universe and of taking or talking to billions of people simultaneously. You mean like a man managed radio waves does to billions of TVs viewers? Is there not billions watching all at once simultaneously using their receivers to receive those communications? You mean we man has done that years ago and is doing it even more so and more advanced? You think God can't do something more advanced than that, Richard? He continued, is a total abdication of the responsibility to find an explanation. In other words, Richard is saying that those who have this view that I just described are being intellectually lazy, he calls it. And so they have to come up with something better than an improbable God. <laughs> Richard continues, the very least that any honest quest for truth, truth seekers, must have in setting out to explain such monstrosities of improbability as a rainforest, a coral, reef, or a universe is a crane and not a skyhook. The crane doesn't have to be natural selection. Admittedly, nobody has ever thought of a better one, but there could be others yet to be discovered. To discovered, he continues. He finished. Now it's me. A crane? Really? 
Now who's suffering a monstrously or monstrosity of a guess of improbable complexity, Richard? Of Richard's improbability argument, the atheist Dan Dennett describes it as an unre unre unreputable excuse me, refutation of the idea of God's existence. This particular chapter, Richard says, contains the central argument of my book. And at the risk of sounding repetitive, I shall summarize it as a series of six numbered points. So here's Richard introducing his six points. One, one of the greatest challenges to the human intellect over the centuries has been to explain how the complex and probable appearance of design in the universe arises. How did it happen? Two, the natural temptation is to attribute the appearance of design, appearance of design, to actual design itself. In the case of a man-made artifact such as a watch, the designer really was an intelligent engineer. It is tempting to apply the same logic to an eye or a wing, a spider or a person, and yes, even to a universe. Three, the temptation is a false one, however, because the designer hypothesis immediately raises the larger problem, once again, of who designed the designer. So this jumps right back to the uh, fallacies. He talks about... Um, Intelligent design being a fallacy and uh, irreducible complexity being a, a falsity because, again, this is the so-called infinite regression problem that Richard repeatedly brings up. It is Richard's chief argument against the existence of God. The whole problem we started out with is obviously not solved by postulating something even more improbable is what it's all about. So that infinite regression is the hook that he's trying to cause all the other dominoes to fall. We need a crane, he says, not a sky hook. For only a crane can do the business of working up gradually and plausibly from simplicity to otherwise improbable complexity. In other words, we must believe the gradual slope of Mount Improbable Theory and reject the God spoke it and it is so hypothesis because it's just far too improbable. Four, the most ingenious and powerful crane so far discovered, he says, discovered, is Darwinian evolution by natural selection. Darwin and his successors have shown how living creatures with their spectacular statistical improbability and appearance of design have evolved by slow, gradual degrees from simple beginnings, using the crane to climb up Mount Improbable Slope. We can now safely say that an illusion of design is living creatures in living creatures is just that, an illusion. I'm seeing no facts here, Richard. Really, have, have you shown it? It has shown, you say? Are there actual living iterations that have been, quote, discovered that cause you to say, man, that's, that's statistically improbable, and yet it's been, look at this example. Or are there just artist renditions and maybe a small number of tiny little broken pieces of old worn out bones that you draw a picture with? We can safely say that, he says, we can safely say that now. Safely say that now? Come on, man. None of this has been proven. And he says so at the beginning of his book. He can't prove God does not exist, just like I can't prove, quote, prove, with scientific evidence that he exists, except maybe in a reducible complexity, in my point of view, really have shown. Are there actual living iterations that have been, quote, discovered, or are there just artist renditions and maybe a small number of tiny broken pieces of old worn-out bone? We can say safely, no. I think not, Richard. The evidence does not affirm this proposition, but Richard continually states it as though it's been successfully shown to be true, when in fact the evidence does not, I repeat, does not confirm any such thing. Saying it has been over and over again doesn't make it true. The so-called evidence put forth for the theory of the evolution of man coming from a lower species like apes is, in my view, the illusion. Again, this is just Richard giving his opinion, though he won't admit it. Continuing with what he listed, number five, we can't, excuse me, we don't, yeah, that was number four, yes, number five. We don't yet have an equivalent crane for physics, he says. Some kind of multiverse theory could, in principle, in principle, do for physics the same explanatory work as Darwinism does for biology. This kind of explanation is superficially less satisfying than the biological version of Darwinism because... It, the multiverse theory, makes heavier demands on luck. Duh! Do you think? Evolution puts the entire weight of all creation on the back of luck. But the anthropic principle, he continues, entitles us to postulate for more luck than our limited human intuition is comfortable with. Could we not use this same logic, Richard, to explain God's improbability? 
give me a break. Six, we should not give up hope of a better crane arising in physics. Something as powerful as Darwinism is for biology. But even in the absence of a strongly satisfying crane to match the biological one, that biological crane being evolution and natural selection, the relatively weak cranes we have at present, meaning his anthropic principle of the crunch and multiverses, are when abetted by the anthropic principle, multiverse, self-evidently better than the self-defeating skyhook hypothesis of an intelligent designer. That is just one long gobbledygook of opinion. Can we not see that? After reviewing these six points, Richard goes on to say that the God hypothesis and religion itself are self-defeating because, because, once again, of his infinite regression question of who created God. Richard says, if the argument of this chapter is accepted, the factual premise of religion, the God hypothesis, is untenable. Richard then concludes this chapter by saying, God most certainly does not exist. Most certainly, really? There you go again, Richard, making a statement as though it is settled science, which it is not. Most certainly does not is a bit arrogant in my point of view, don't you think? Especially when Richard has already admitted he cannot disprove God's existence. Richard goes on to say, quote, this is the main conclusion of the book, his book, The God Delusion. I've, if I've understood Richard's argument regarding cranes, I believe the reverse of Richard's argument of cranes would be this. If the argument of this chapter is not accepted, meaning the premise of atheism's claim that Darwinism is true, it is in fact tenable, right? You can't have it both ways, Richard. Richard keeps forgetting that his logic can be turned around and used against his own dogmatic claims, which he repeatedly has expressed as though they are settled science, when in fact they are not. Like Richard's opinion he just expressed, my opinion of this chapter and its six points is that it most certainly makes more logical sense to me to not accept the arguments laid out in this chapter. I'm particularly referring to Richard's argument that we're just waiting for scientists to come up with a slow, small, iteration-directing crane for physics and the cosmos that comes into being via luck which has not happened in more than 6,000 years from the time of Adam and Eve until now. And the probability that it will come about in this way is extremely improbable. The Darwinian crane, as Richard calls it, is at best a big guess stuffed by a series of misleading and at times outright deceptions by scientists in order to keep the big lie going. I would suggest once again that it is important for you to watch the YouTube video titled Genesis Impact full movie. So you can remind yourself of the reasons why I feel I can say that Darwinian's evolution theory is the big lie, the big illusion. Each of the six points become weaker and weaker as one moves from the first point on to the next point and finally ends up on the last point where Richard says, quote, we should not give up hope of a better crane arising in physics, something as powerful as Darwinism is for biology. But even in the absence of a strong, satisfying crane to match the biological one, the relatively weak cranes we have at present are, when abetted by the anthropic principle, the theory of the multiverse, self-evidently better than the self-defeating skyhook apothecary of an intelligent designer, end quote. With physics standing without a so-called crane, Richard offers the weak crane abetted by the anthropic principle, which is simply a theory of the multiverse, which, in my opinion, as I've said, is simply a big, fat guess that scientists have named the multiverse. Richard closes his subtitle and chapter by saying that with the God hypothesis being proven untenable, <laughs> there he goes, we're ready to move on and answer the questions that religion itself poses. Proven ten untenable? Incapable of being defended? Really, Richard? Come on. Good hunk in the morning is what I like to say. You've got to be kidding me, Richard. Richard finishes by asking, even if we accept that God doesn't exist, I'm not doing that, doesn't religion still have a lot going for it? That's how he ends his subtitle on this chapter. He says, doesn't religion have a lot going for it? Well, having asked this leading question, Richard then dedicates the rest of his book, six chapters, to giving arguments on each of the subtitles found in the Roots of Religion, beginning with the first subtitle, The Darwinian Imperative. In these subtitles, Richard tries to destroy anything that religion may have going for it, meaning anything that would or could possibly be used to support the effort to prove God's existence. Well, that's the end of, end of chapter of this particular subtitle and of the chapter four in my book and Richard's book. So the next six chapters are very, very interesting. He tries to completely dismantle religion in every possible way. But until next time, 
I want to see your questions. I want to see those comments show up. I'm going to do my best to answer them and reply. But until next time, I wish you continued success. Goodbye.